You're listening to the Friends Talking Nerdy Podcast Network. Friends Talking Nerdy! If your friends are nerdy and you are nerdy too, I want to talk to you. Friends Talking Nerdy! Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. This is Tim Jowsma, and joining me all the way in Portland, Maine, we have here Holiness, the Reverend Tracy. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty great, Tim, uh, other than my cat acting like a fucking psycho. Uh, <laughs> I know I mentioned on the show that my cat was going through some shit, and uh, yeah, apparently the medicine that they wanted me to give her is a stimulant, and I didn't think that all the way through before giving it to the cat before bed which resulted in her acting like a maniac all night. Uh, it's <laughs> The way we've explained it is the way Beans is acting is like she's constantly playing this game called The Floor is Lava, and the entire downstairs is now lava, and she is terrified of it. So um, now we're trying to like reintroduce her to the downstairs and everything. Super exciting times. Um, she's mostly a pretty boring cat, so it's it's been a little bit side stressor. But other than that, the Mr. Reverend and I took in another awesome docu series. I like to bring those up whenever you know we take those in. There's one on Netflix called Keep Sweet. So if you guys are out there looking for another. Holy shit, that totally happened slash is still kind of creepily happening. Um, you can watch the story of the FLDS leader, Warren Jeffs. Keep sweet on Netflix. But we just finished that last night, and I will warn the last episode is probably the hardest to watch because they do go into the um, the victims talking on stand. And it's the live recording of like what happened whenever they were talking about what happened to them. But super interesting series if you're looking for another one out there to watch, guys. Yeah, interesting that uh, it sounds like your cat at the end of the day was like the feline version of like a Al Pacino and Scarface at the end of the movie, you know, <laughs> just running around. Everywhere. I mean, basically, she kept like touching my ear and like standing on the corner of stuff, just mowing at nothing. And so I was telling the Mr. Reverend, it's like she's probably standing there going, dude, mom, do you see that? Like, and I Whoa. guess my, my biggest takeaway is maybe don't give your cat crack and expect to be able to sleep at night. Like, that's not going to go well for you. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. She's just grounded from her medicine for 48 hours. And yeah, then we'll, we'll try it again later. But um, what have, what have you been up to? Oh, me. I am back house sitting. And I got to welcome, thanks to the United States Postal Service, Four new pullets uh, to the already two grown-up chickens that are here. And um, I got to name them. Uh, you actually uh, helped me uh, name one of them as well, Dumplin'. But we have Dumplin', yeah. we have Moxie, we have Dolly, and we have Barbariana. Yes, because I need to name animals food. It is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that with kittens. Um, when my mother used to like, or like she'd take in orphan cats for the city and they'd like go back named like potato or one was moo because I thought it ate like a cow. Like, I don't know. I like naming animals foods basically. And what's well, great is any of them could really be a dumpling if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is why I've had to uh, keep an eye out for them because the previous uh, pullets that were here um, were considered dumplings by the raccoons that killed them. So. <laughs> oh, that got dark. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, you, you got a little dark too, so I got to bring my little darkness here. That's the fun of what we do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Murder and mayhem and all that. But we have some special guests here with us this week. Why don't you introduce them? So basically in the world of me knowing my brother super well, I actually just learned that he does something that I think is really cool, which is essentially um, going on these sort of challenges. And I will allow them to correct me, by the way, if I explain any of this wrong. But they seem to pick like a die cast car, like a Hot Wheels car or something, and they'll give it a theme and they will make over the car and sometimes also do it almost diorama style. So in that journey, I've decided to bring my brother on and then I met his friend, Ben, and I thought we could talk to them and nerd out a little bit about this kind of hobby that you can do. Um, so I guess first, hi, Chris and Ben, you guys want to just say a quick hello. Hello. How's it going? I'm Ben. Yeah, a little bit about you, Ben. So uh, how did you get into this? 
Yeah, so there's a game, uh, like a tabletop game called Gaslands. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, if you've ever seen Mad Max, uh, that's pretty close to the theme of the game. It's like post-apocalyptic uh, wasteland. Mm, the game is a bit different itself, but most people interpret it that way, the theme. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I live in Japan, mm -hmm. and there aren't really many people around. I live in a pretty rural area, so I don't actually play the game. But I kind of fell in love with the, the little models uh, and started making those and got into that and got on Facebook. Uh, and that's how I met Chris through the Facebook group for Gaslands. Uh, yeah, I just kind of went from there. I've always kind of made things. Uh, but getting into this hobby, I've gotten a lot more intense <laughs> with it recently. So what would you call like what you do? What is this hobby, I guess, to put a name <laughs> to it? <laughs> uh, somewhere between crafting and model making. Right. OK, so, Chris, what about you? Um, talk about your origin into all of this and then we'll go into probably some other questions later. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Chris. I'm, I'm T's brother. Um, I got into this whole thing. Uh, a bunch of different factors kind of led to it. Um, I was doing Warhammer 40k for a while, and I really got into like painting the miniatures and things like that. So I wound up on Reddit, um, kind of checking out of their like hobby boards, you know, D and D, what have you. Um, and while I was on there, somebody posted a picture of a Hot Wheels that they modified with, you know, guns and armor and everything and said, you know, this is my car for Gaslands. And I fell in love immediately because I was also, uh, ever since I was a kid, um, really into the Twisted Metal franchise of video games. So those two things, like, coalesced. And then I, within the next, like, two days of seeing that Reddit post, I already had the rule book ordered. I already had a trunk full of Hot Wheels from driving around, like, raiding uh, Dollar Generals and whatnot. And I was already, like, my whole YouTube subscription page changed to, like, crafting channels and things like what Ben does. And uh, just kind of... Took off from there, and I haven't really stopped for three years. Yeah, I mean, being your sister, I can totally go back in time and remember this. Because I remember, like, painting Warhammer at our friend Joel's house. And the, for some reason, like, the craziest memory I have is for some reason there was, like, these monkeys that we threw up in the air and, like, went into the fan. And you just yelled, beware the flying monkeys. Um, <laughs> so I, what's funny is I don't remember painting them, but I do remember like them being around. Like, I remember I always wanted to paint them, but I never joined you in on this. You did all of the painting and you were also like a hell of an artist. So I guess it doesn't really surprise me too much, um, that you got into kind of building these models. Um, Ben, did you start off like early, early in art world too? Like, was there kind of some predecessor hobbies that led into getting into this? Yeah, so hmm, it's kind of hard to remember. <laughs> but uh, so my my family, a lot a lot of people in my family are artists. Uh, so I guess I've always had an influence in that way. Uh, like my mom, my mom and my sister are both professional artists currently, uh, and my grandparent, my grandfather's a jeweler. Uh, my grandmother does art and quilting and other things like that. So especially my mom's side. Of the family like everyone's uh everyone's always done art and crafts around me and another big aspect i think maybe even more important than the art side was the diy side of things so my parents like growing up with not a lot of money uh they always did home renovation jobs themselves and uh it was always like why but why pay for someone else to do it when you can just learn how to do it yourself so kind of through that my my journey i guess my hobby journey uh it kind of evolved through like uh diy home reno tool restore morphing into prop making morphing into uh D, &D tabletop uh, terrain you know following people on youtube like chris was talking about black magic craft and eric's hobby workshop places like that and Wylock, of course. If anyone, if anyone familiar with the hobby will know these names that I'm dropping right now. But, <laughs> oh, meanwhile, uh, it's like Tim and I are probably right over our head. 
Yeah, but just just uh, kind of growing up through that and then also like still not really having a lot of money. Gas lines is perfect because, you know, how much is a Hot Wheels car? <laughs> a buck or two. Even in Japan, I can get them for two bucks. So I think even at the most expensive, I haven't spent more than like five dollars on a unit in this game. Whereas, you know, Warhammer, it goes up to like 40, 60, 100 and something just for one oh, thing to get on the table out of the dozens you need to play it. <laughs> Now, for the uninitiated at home, such as myself, um, I'm going to put make myself vulnerable here and, and, and not pretend like I know everything here. What is Gaslands? So, Chris, you want to take this one? Yeah, I, I guess I play a little more than you do, <laughs> uh, just from availability. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Gaslands. It's a it's a tabletop uh, strategy game uh, played with Hot Wheels. Basically, it's got a series of templates that you use uh, to determine your direction and movement. And um, <laughs> don't worry about that. So it's got a it's got the templates that you use to determine direction and movement. Um, how fast you're going limits the selection of templates that you have available to you for movement. So it really does a good job of uh, emulating um, momentum and stuff like that. On top of that, it's like a combat racing type thing. So there's uh, Death Race is the most common mode. There's uh, Zombie Bash where you're just driving around trying to get a high score running over pedestrians. Um, and then... Uh, you know, it's got a few different game modes. I haven't got to play all of them myself because uh, I got more people to play with than Ben over there, but not a lot still. So it's kind of rare that I get to have a game off. So can it's almost like Grand Theft Auto, but you can't like have sex with hookers and kill them and take their money. <laughs> I don't what's think that's the point. Exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> well, then what's the point if I can't like just pick up hookers and use them and steal their cash. What's the point? Um, so yeah, it's I, for some reason, so it's a tabletop game, but there's also what a computer element to it. No. Okay. Just the meat computer in your skull. Just the meat computer in your skull. I like it. <laughs> yep. Basically but, to boil that down for even more uninitiated people is you're moving a bunch of strangely painted cars across a table trying to destroy the other cars <laughs> that's it in a nutshell <laughs> on point um i have a random question for ben actually just based off of what you were just saying a bit ago so you said your dad's a jeweler so i'm sure there's like a lot of interesting tools like is there anything you've used like in the jewelry tool range that you think um like maybe your fellow modelers don't use or that you've had to use something like in the jewelry tool range like for something totally off the wall from what it was or how did the jewelry tools kind of help you out in this i guess okay so my my grandfather's a jeweler oh grandfather uh, go. yeah and uh so i don't i haven't had much uh influence from that directly Okay. I worked I worked on a project with him before, like here and there in the past when I was really young. Uh, it was for some kind of school art project when I was in elementary school. But uh, in terms of jewel jewelers tools, uh, I don't think I'm using anything that other people wouldn't be using. And the most common one is a jeweler's saw, which is kind of like if you know what a scroll saw is, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like a scroll saw but even thinner. So basically it lets you maneuver the blade uh, any direction that you need to, and it cuts through metal really easily, especially the, the die cast metal is soft. So that's, that's kind of a staple of die cast uh, customizers. Gotcha. So that's like the tool that everybody probably uses. I think a lot less people than should be uh, are using it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those tools that like once you know, you know, and, and you get one and you can use it, but there is a steep learning curve and you break a ton of blades uh, before you get it down because they're so thin. I mean, we're talking like, like, like a millimeter, maybe even less. I don't, I don't know how, how, how wide they actually are, but they're really, really small blades and you're going to snap a bunch of them before you get one right. Gotcha. So probably the biggest learning curve, but the best tool to teach yourself for doing something like this. I think so. I think there's not much learning curve, uh, at least in the way that I do things. I don't know, like anyone, anyone who watches one of my videos will, I don't know if you can tell after it's edited, but I'm just kind of spitballing until it looks good. <laughs> 
but you know, uh, I'm doing well. have, <laughs> having seen exactly one of your videos, I can actually say that I felt like that was pretty much what I got out of it. Um, <laughs> and good. right, I mean, that makes sense because it's a creative, like there's a lot of creatives that don't know what their piece is going to look like until they're done. Um, my background comes more from building cosplay. Uh, you normally start with a base and then you just kind of like pick a basic base that will kind of fit the theme to what you're going for. And then you kind of slowly but surely add on like those extra little pieces and then you do your finer detail. Is that pretty much kind of the same step with what you guys do? Yeah, I think um, it, it kind of depends for me. So in my, I don't know if this might just be my brain, but in my brain, there are like different types of builds. So one, one of the most common I think everyone is, is doing is just taking a car that exists and deconstructing it in some way and then kind of sticking things onto it. So that's one, that's probably the most common way. Uh, but then there's this whole other category of scratch building, uh, which is basically starting from nothing. Uh, so no no die cast car to begin with, and then like you're saying, you build like you start with a form. So you're building up a form that will look good, and then you start sticking bits on here and there, or uh, cutting pieces away or adding detail. I mean that that that's probably like more in my head <laughs> what's going on, but I don't know how I don't know how Chris designs his cars. Well, Chris, how do you design your cars? <laughs> like when you get a theme, let's just put you in the hot seat there. <laughs> Um, I think you're muted. Volume. Uh, did I have that on backwards this whole time? I'm sorry if you guys heard me burping or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so quick aside, uh, one of Ben's more popular videos on his channel is a scratch bus built that he made. And, you know, I'll, I'll brag on him for that. That thing was cool. Um, absolutely worth checking out. But uh, as for me, yeah, no problem. Man. Um, but as for me, I... Um, it's it's a mix. Sometimes I'll go in there and just improvise an entire build. Other times I try to like sort it out on like a concept end first. Uh, one thing I do is um, I come up with driver bios. So you know I, I get really deep into like the lore writing end of this, which is you know another aspect of the hobby not everybody takes up. But um, you know I try to think of the driver and like what kind of car would this individual drive and that informs things like maybe how the armor is bolted on whether it looks clean or if it's rusted what kind of paint i would use stuff like that uh, but for the most part i'd say it's improv so you you create a character driver for yours is that what i'm understanding yeah um, i mentioned earlier i was really into the twisted metal franchise growing up and that's still a huge inspiration um, for the stuff that i do um, so I kind of base it off of the driver bios from those games. Just a real quick little paragraph about the character, um, all of which I've got up with the uh, corresponding cars on my website. Uh, you know, if anybody ever wants to check that out. Um, I also do plan on expanding on the lore of the game, which is something that in the rulebook provided isn't very in depth because uh, they didn't want it to like impede on anyone's enjoyment of the the crafting process. You know. Yeah, not giving too many rules so people didn't feel like they, they had to like fit a certain either theme or look or what have you. Yeah, because um, one thing coming from the Warhammer 40k stuff, like they have all these rules and guidelines that really define how you're even allowed to paint your army, um, just based on the lore that comes with the book. And that is the exact opposite of Gaslands. They are so deep with their lore. They got novels, they've got new supplements coming out all the time. It's insane. Um, but because of that, you know, there's some tournaments that won't even let you bring your army to the table if it doesn't match one of the paint schemes officially released by Games Workshop or something like that. Uh, Gaslands, you don't have to worry so much about that kind of thing. It's more uh, creative. Uh, it's more creative. Yeah, Another less of the guidelines. Sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, like, less guideline-y, right? Like, it, it's kind of trying to leave it open for the creatives. Got it. Yeah. Right. I was All gonna right. say another another good thing about Gaslands talking about compared with other war games is that it's not uh, there's this thing I'm, I mean it's it's a common term the WYSIWYG right what you see is what you get but in in war gaming that literally means if the model has a machine gun in the game mechanics your character has a machine gun 
or if you have heavy armor on your model, that means that you're using heavy armor in the game. But with Gaslands, uh, it, maybe it, it can possibly become confusing if your car is like decked out in rocket launchers and stuff, and then in game you only have like, you know, a ram like a, a big chunk of metal in the front of your car, right? But it's that that lets you, it gives you that freedom and frees you from those guidelines that you're talking about. Yeah, so basically you can make it look as cool as you want and it doesn't necessarily have to either restrict or mean anything for the functionality of it in the game. Right, and you don't have to rebuild your model if you want to change your strategy, right? Very cool. All right. Yeah, and it's cheap enough. I just buy new ones whenever I want to try something out anyway. <laughs> I've got like a hundred of these things. <laughs> All right, got a question here for either one of you. When you get a theme, what's the first thing you do for inspiration? Oh, good question. So, oh man, I think it kind of depends on the theme. Uh, like <laughs> this to- very topical, the the overgrown forest slash mushroom theme was one of the more difficult ones i think to fit into uh the gaslands box uh, obviously you've seen what i made <laughs> it's not it's not really a car anymore uh i went but full very tree. cool looking just throwing <laughs> it out there and we will include the link to that youtube probably in the show notes here for anybody who wants to see that it is a really cool process to watch i highly encourage it but yeah so when you got my my stepdaughter's theme for you guys where did you go first to like find that like what brought you to the tree monster even like what was that like getting to making a tree monster yeah so when i heard overgrown uh And in relation to a car, it makes me think that a tree is growing out of a car. And that's kind of, I mean, I've seen pictures of something like that. You know, if you look at like abandoned, uh, abandoned wasteland pictures or, you know, people take pictures of abandoned buildings and vehicles all the time. We might see them come across them on Instagram (laughs) when when your Instagram feed looks like uh, what I make. (laughs) So... Uh, just and also when I actually when I was working at my previous job across the road there was this jeep sat in the middle of a field with this tree growing out of the hood (laughs) so that kind of also just stuck in my mind Uh, but yeah there's a there's a uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster called the Shambling Mound Uh, and I I talk about it in that video but basically it's I might be complete. I might be a little bit wrong on the lore here, but I think there's like some lightning strike has animated uh, some clump of organic matter that's like this mass of trees and vines and things, and it's silently moving through the swamps, devouring people <laughs> that happen to come in come into its domain, I guess. But uh, I kind of it my my build ended up being like, is it a tree or is it alive? Right? It's kind of there's, there's subtle hit, well, subtle, I don't know. It depends how close you look. There's a bunch of skulls in the back. But, uh, and yeah. blood. I like the blood. <laughs> <laughs> right. The finished product is very subtle, and you might not even notice the, the blood-soaked skulls in, filling the back of his, his trunk. But, yeah, I, I wanted it to look like maybe the tree's about to grab you, but maybe it's just an overgrown tree. Gotcha. Do you tend to pull from D&D a lot, or is that just where you happen to be inspired for this theme? Uh, I don't, let me think about that. I don't think D and D overlap into Gaslands is not very large, at least in my brain. I, I've played some D and D just fifth edition. Uh, I played for a few years. I don't play currently. Um, but certainly in crafting in general, like when I'm approaching making terrain or, something like that. A lot of the inspiration and other crafters out there are uh, crafting quote unquote terrain, uh, tabletop models that you would play on top of. So uh, land masses or trees or buildings. So a lot of, a lot of the work out there, I guess the body of work out there to draw from is uh, based on D and D or Pathfinder or different tabletop games like that. 40 K. Gotcha. And then what about you, Chris? Whenever you get a theme, where where do you go to try to get your inspiration and get ideas? I've only done really uh, two head-to-head builds, both of them against Ben, and Google helped a lot. Uh, our first one was uh, samurai-themed. So I spent a lot of time just like 
Googling samurai armor and trying to get like ideas for color palettes and stuff like that off of it. Um, as far as self-imposed themes, a lot of stuff comes from the uh, the driver bios again. Like it, it really does. Like if I could come up with a creative story for a character, it really does help like flesh out a build. So I'm not just making the same four wheels of the machine gun bolted to it over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of a lot of the talking about themes though, something that I haven't brought up is kind of how I cut my teeth in <laughs> this hobby, but on the Gaslands UK page on Facebook, not to directly plug anything I'm part of, but <laughs> <laughs> the Gaslands UK page, uh, we have a monthly competition that's called Car of the Month. Uh, and there's a theme, we have sponsors. I'm saying we because I'm an admin of this group, just <laughs> to put that out there. Uh we, there's a there's a theme, and everyone has a month to start. They have to start their car within the month and end uh, before the last Sunday of the month. And that is actually how I started making these cars specifically. By I found James Hall's YouTube channel. He was making the car of the month wrap up videos at the time. I thought it would be cool to try to make something like that and maybe get into the video, maybe win, <laughs> possibly, but. <laughs> You know, that, that was, that was way out of reach at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> I did end up winning in November of 2020. So that was pretty cool. But, uh, that, that's like a crazy theme every month. So it might be like flying cars or steampunk or, uh, cyberpunk or like samurai. That that was our head to head theme, but something like that. Right. Or like th- recently we had punk or like jet engine propelled or, we did mono wheels. That was a fun one. You could only have one wheel touching the ground. So, <laughs> and there's some amazing, like people way better than me in this group making amazing stuff. Awesome. Um, so I guess like what, one question I'll just go ahead and go with Chris. I'll go with you first. Um, what was your first creation and what was your favorite creation in this world? I think the first car, so I build in batches of like five at a time. I think the car I finished painting first was a uh, Hot Wheels skull shaker um, that I named Fury Toad. (laughs) Just straight up for the pun. (laughs) That was before I was doing driver bios or anything like that. It's, it doesn't even fit the setting that the character driving the car would know what that means because the world ended in 1999 in Gaslands. (laughs) But um, that was the first one I did. Uh, I'm actually in the process of doing another Bone Shaker, which is a, the original variant of the Skull Shaker. Uh, just to kind of see where I've come hobby-wise, like to see how much better it looks now than that very first car. Um, and then as far as the favorite, I think... I did a... I did a version of Twisted Metal Black's Crazy 8, and I think that is probably the favorite car I've ever made. Um, it actually involved the, my first attempt at fusing two bodies together. So it's like the hood of it is from a Model T Ford, and then the cabin back is from a Volkswagen, and I think uh, it turned out pretty all right. It's one of the more popular ones I put out on the Facebook group, too. Yeah, a little side question. What is a bone shaker? <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. I don't think it's a real car. <laughs> it's just a Hot Wheels hot rod type thing. Okay. Oh, so pe- you, people could – you could Google, like, hot rod bone shaker. It's just the name of the car. Yeah, the bone shaker or the skull shaker are two different uh, – well, the skull shaker is named as such because it has a little dude that rides in it. And whenever the car rolls, he shakes back and forth so his head's banging around. That was actually the first one I did. I took the little guy out and used him for an ice cream truck later. But uh, the Bone Shaker is what that's based off of, and that's the one I'm working on now. The Bone Shaker is pretty divisive. <laughs> you either love it or you hate it, I think. <laughs> it is definitely one of those cars that pretty much everybody that is in Gaslands has probably worked on at some point. Like It is right. super common for people to pull that one. It took me a while, but I made one. <laughs> I did one with Ricky. I did a, a head-to-head with uh, Ricky from the UK group, and our theme was voodoo. So, oh, I, I don't. Bet that I didn't, looks cool. That was before my that was before my YouTube channel. Uh, so I don't have a video, but it's on my Instagram. I I actually whittled I whittled little bones to put on the wheels out of toothpicks. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's pretty cool. So uh, was that your favorite or I guess what was your first and what was your favorite, Ben? I thought you weren't going to ask such a hard question. <laughs> I know, such hard hitting questions. <laughs> the first, the first one is easy. So the first, uh, I guess it's kind of easy. So the first like dapple I did was uh, I just kind of took I took a really beat up Tomika, which is another brand of uh, it's a Japanese brand of diecast. Uh, it's a Stagia, so it's kind of like a station wagon, Nissan station wagon. And it was already, the paint was already all chipped up from, you know, a kid playing with it because I bought it secondhand. Uh, and I, I used some acrylic paints to weather it. And I put some like uh, knitting mesh, the plastic knitting mesh in the window is like bars. And it was pretty, it was a pretty sad attempt, but I did, I did actually drill out the rivets and open it up. And I put a little driver inside and, and painted everything up and, that was my first dabble, like I said, and then I built a couple cars that I didn't end up, I still haven't painted them. They're sitting up in my craft room, just they're still in primer. And then I built another car that got half painted. And then I actually, the first full like in-depth build that I did was for my first car of the month. And that was like, that, that was August of 2020. So that's, that was like my, my step onto the stage of <laughs> themed builds. And it was a, it was a bit nuts. Like the theme was uh, steampunk and I built a steampunk flying car and my sister named it the lightning harvester. So this like really, it's, it's really hard to describe. I wish I could show you what it looks like, but it's, it's on a flying stand and there's actually LEDs inside. And I made like a stained glass windshield and it's, it's pretty, it was pretty intense for my first build. And it's, it's really rough. Like looking at it now, <laughs> the paint, the metallic paints are so chunky. Oh man. But my favorite build. Oh, I know I'm making you pick between yeah. your babies. This was not a fair question. <laughs> favorite build is super hard, but I think right now it kind of changes, right? <laughs> so but we'll go I, with who's your current favorite. Who's your current of your children. <laughs> that's your favorite. Yeah, like <laughs> My current favorite child uh, is, the i did an el camino uh wagon so this was another head-to-head -head challenge with someone in the gaslands uk group and uh, we took an el camino and we had to convert it into a, a wagon so i threw like it looks like a, a truck topper that i built out of plastic on the back and then i lifted it up as like a monster truck and i built the chassis and, and the suspension and everything out of uh styrene bits and I put the I put an engine like in the back, so basically coming at there's a hole in the in the wagon topper, <laughs> and the it's open the 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 engine sticking out of the back. But I thought like that wouldn't that be cool if like all the windows blew out because the engine is sitting in the back of this thing. So I took some clear plastic and broke it up into little like shards and glued it around. So it looks like the windows are all smashed out. So this this is one of my favorites. Uh, it's green and it, it's the rust uh, contrasts well with the green. And then also there's a white door because you have to have that asymmetry. <laughs> but I think the most popular part of this build that I've gotten the most comments on is I strapped a log as the front bumper onto it. And so many people uh, react to this like, wow, this there's a log on the front of your car. So that's probably actually, my favorite uh, at the moment. Because of that build, I actually have a little box of sticks over here that I'm planning on putting <laughs> on my cars later. I just haven't got around to it yet. <laughs> Full disclosure, that was actually a 172nd uh, military kit bit that I kind of hacked up. <laughs> so that's it's not actually wood. Yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> That looks really good. <laughs> well, I guess that, that just kind of inspired a question. Like, what's the most interesting thing you've wound up folding into one of your builds? Like, I mean, I think you may have already answered it, but was there anything that kind of sticks out that was an interesting implement that you used to get a, a look on your build? So the craziest, actually, you would never guess, and it's not what I've already said. Uh, I built a Halloween truck. Oh, am I still here? Yeah, you're still here. Yes. Oh, okay. Everything glitched it, it, out for me. No, it did for me too, but you're totally fine. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so uh, I built a Halloween truck. Like, this was right after I started. So it must have been October 2020. 
uh, with it's a pump. It's like the theme was possessed. I think that was the theme for car of the month at the time. And I made like, I wanted to make a truck that was like a pumpkin truck, you know, like a farm truck that carries around pumpkins. You've probably seen them. Uh, but I wanted it to be like, I guess embodied or like possessed by an evil spirit of pumpkin plant. <laughs> so there's like vines busting out of the car everywhere. And the back that's filled with pumpkins, how, how can you find one sixty fourth scale pumpkins, right? No one right. has them. I didn't have a 3D printer at the time. I have one now, but uh, I actually carved with little gouges and, and files, garbanzo beans, so chickpeas, into little pumpkins. So every one of those pumpkins is me sat there with a V gouge, like carving lines and bumps in, into garbanzo beans. <laughs> That is pretty amazing. Like I'm, I'm a fan of all the things you can do with a garbanzo bean, but that's the first <laughs> I've heard uh, using it for a model. But that's pretty fucking cool. Um, and I, I can't. I, I almost wanted to joke that the glitch was because I was so excited that you had a haunted themed vehicle because I'm a haunter <laughs> person. Um, I don't. I really doubt Chris would have mentioned it, but I'm. I'm. I work for a haunted house, so I would love uh-huh. to see this if you have a photo of it around, like just on the side. Even if we don't share it with the listeners, um, <clears throat> I want to see the car. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, <laughs> but Chris, what about you? What's the most interesting or off-wall thing you wound up incorporating into a build? I'm taken aback by those garbanzo beans. <laughs> right? Oh, did you? Have I you did seen not. that build? I have that. That pumpkin truck is actually one of my favorite things Ben's made. I thought whenever uh, Ben, you said you won a car of the month in 2020, I thought that was the car that won it for you. Uh, was no, it I that didn't even place. I don't even think I placed that month. You got robbed. I I play. I won the with my plague doctor buggy. Ah, that would have been my second guess. That thing's also. Cool. <laughs> um, God, weirdest thing I've ever used. God, I just collect so much garbage. It's. <laughs> hard to say like if i find any piece of plastic or metal that's smaller than a nickel it goes in my pocket and then into my bits box so i don't even know where some of this stuff came from you're like um, a pigeon hey yeah kind of <laughs> <laughs> uh, i had uh, one of my roommates uh came up once and was they got a new phone and they had this old phone case and like can you use this for anything and i was i took it I, i've still got bits of it around here i wound up turning it into bumpers side skirts all kinds of stuff but as is the Reverend going to have to hold an intervention for you down the road for hoarding? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. We'll give it another 20 years. I might have a whole room dedicated to just piles of little scraps of trash. <laughs> uh, this is a very happens. common thread with people oh, who, who make things at scale. or uh, We all have giant heaps of, like, who knows what in boxes all around the room. <laughs> you know what? Oh, yeah. I ha- I have to be totally fair as somebody who's done, like, cosplay and costuming and stuff. Uh, same thing. Um, you will justify buying whatever crap, like from glasses to, oh, there's a thing on the ground. Maybe I shouldn't take the thing off the ground and use it on my body. <laughs> I'm trying kind of conversations. So, so yeah, Chris, kinda, just kind of, you, you scavenge and get all sorts of stuff then, right? Like, so that's kind of your oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I've, I've got a, I got a couple decent parking lot finds. Uh, like I'm, I'm standing out there waiting for some tow truck guy to move my car once, and there's just this thing on the ground. And I, while I'm talking to him, just reach down, stuff it in my pocket without even thinking about it. And that's sitting here waiting to be turned into a cannon housing or something. I don't know. <laughs> It does kind of make me wonder what people think, like, if, especially if anybody's ever noticed, like, there's this guy and he just picks up stuff and, like, puts it in his pocket. It's just oh, like, yeah, there's got to be people in, like, apartment complexes that have been watching me through their window, just, like, rifling through the sidewalk and just picking things up and squinting at them and then just, nah, throwing it back down on the ground or putting it back in my pocket, like, like a magpie or something. <laughs> it's like a poor man's crow. <laughs> You're just looking for little plastic bits instead of the shiny things. Exactly. And that, and that goes back to what I was talking about, accessibility is like how much like li- I can't even I can't even tell you how little I've spent on everything I've used in this hobby I like part of that is from necessity and it's kind of hard now because uh, like adjusting to having a little bit more cash to spend on the hobby which I, I recently have a little bit of li- a wiggle room there but like actually allowing myself to buy things Versus like just just grabbing some some junk and sticking it together because that's part of the fun. It's like how can I take a bunch of stuff that is worthless and make something amazing out of it? 
I and you can really like exactly anyone can do that. Yeah. yeah, like there's something so satisfying about taking a bunch of crap like, uh, you know, for costuming, it's Goodwill, right? Like you go and you kind of pick through Goodwill and stuff and seeing how you can make things over. And I can see like where that would be relatable in that sense of like, I, I don't know. I find it more satisfying when I can take trash and repurpose it into something cool that's not just going to like go be in a landfill if you want to think super high, <laughs> high end hippie on that. Like, um. Yeah, so I've I've gotten more like income in my life and my hobbies. And I don't know, Chris, maybe you agree or disagree, but I find it more satisfying to kind of work with junk than to necessarily be able to go and like price grab price grab and like buy stuff. But what about you guys? Is it more fun that way? I'm kind of a free agent on it. because uh, like like I said, I'm coming out of forty K, so everything out of this hobby <laughs> right. is so much cheaper than what that was. And I was like I, I that was like a once a year like when I got my tax return I'd go buy some 40k stuff um, but now this one I could kind of do it year round a little bit at a time so I'm probably spending way more money on this hobby than any of my prior ones just from nickel and diming myself <laughs> but um, I think that's oh, sorry. no you good I was gonna say I, I think that it's also like uh, it's pretty dangerous when things each piece each piece that you buy itself is cheaper which makes you buy more. And I think anyone yeah. anyone who's into buying die cast cars, even just collectors, <laughs> will tell you how how expensive one dollar cars get. <laughs> like, I, I think I have I don't I haven't counted them, but like buying I buy a lot of secondhand stuff just in Japan. If I buy new die casts, it's a bit too much for me. Uh, it's a bit expensive. I, the Japanese Tomica brand, it's it's about four dollars per car. Uh, if I go out and get a new Tomica, so I can get the used ones for anywhere from a dollar to three dollars, you know. But uh, it it all adds up. And my other weakness is the dollar store, which here it's a hundred yen shops. And oh my gosh, I need to do I need to like convince one of the stores to let me just go in and film, like walking through and kind of my process of looking at every single item in the store, thinking how can I turn this into something insane. But like when you go to the dollar store, you're like, it's just a dollar. It's just a dollar. And then you go and you spend $30. It's like, whoa, that <laughs> that's not a dollar anymore. <laughs> that happened quick, man. Well, it's like, well, hey, I got to point out if it's if the 100 yen store is anything like um, the shopping experience that is the dollar tree or the dollar <laughs> store. I don't think they're going to care if you record. I think they're kind of used to just high things happening. But it, so, see, and that makes me almost want to ask like a not even related question of like, what is a 100 yen store like? Like, I have no idea. But it sounds like it's basically like a dollar general or a dollar store, right? It's it's amazing. No, it's so I'm from Florida uh, originally. So I've seen some stuff, you know, <laughs> in a dollar tree. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, just the level, the level of, um, the level of product, of course, the level of presentation is beyond, you know, the, the, the price point of the Dollar Tree, <laughs> but the, the product as well, like I can get, like, I, like I was talking about styrene, uh, polystyrene materials, which is basically like a, a raw material of plastic sheeting and tubing, uh, that a lot of hobby people use it's the same material as like a plastic kit like a model kit that you would buy so you can glue it with plastic cement uh but i can actually get sheets of styrene at my dollar store at my hundred in shop which is like unbelievable I, some hobby shops don't even have <laughs> styrene materials so i can i can find a whole lot of things uh here that i could you could never even imagine finding in a dollar store and i think even in just in general like taking it out of the hobby a bit uh just in general in japan i think if you were to survey most people living in japan over half of everything in everyone's house came from the dollar store <laughs> like there's so many household items and just useful things that everyone is constantly it's like oh like that's the first place you check like you're gonna go check the yakuen shop the 100 yen stop shop and then you know, you're going to see if it's there and if it's not, okay, well then you have to actually go buy it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That sounds like what I do sometimes with Dollar Tree. Dollar <laughs> and, and actually just to throw it out there for any other crafters listening, um, that game has gone way up. Like if you've been, Chris, I don't know if you ever go into a Dollar Tree, 
but they I've noticed like even before I moved over in Portland, Oregon, and now that I'm here in Portland, Maine, like the craft section is nuts. Like you, they've got these cry cut machines where you have to buy these vinyl like rolls and they have those there now. Hmm. And uh, although funny enough, they, they did have hot glue guns. But on a funny side note, I've kind of become friends with the people that work at the, the Dollar Tree because, you know, I'm there too much. And um, she, she was like, oh, you didn't get one of those glue guns, did you? And I'm like, no. She goes, oh, good. They recalled those. So um, there's still a little bit of maybe grain of salt with, with getting stuff at our dollar stores. But. <laughs> I love how you got Texas uh, th- thrown in there with that. <laughs> I, I don't mean to. Like, <laughs> when I, I guess when I think of folksy people, I still just pull out my Texan accent. I don't mean to. <laughs> Well, I do have a question here uh, for both Ben and Chris. Um, You both have outlets online, uh, Ben with your YouTube channel and Chris with your website to where you showcase uh, a lot of the stuff. Uh, Tell the folks at home uh, about it. We'll start with you, Chris. Uh, What type of uh, stuff could they uh, expect to find on your website? Uh, Right now it's pretty bare bones. I just got it um, set up like two weeks ago. Uh, took a little while to get all the coding on it done. Um, but right now it's a gallery of all the cars, driver bios, and even uh, the, the – they're called dashboards in the game. It's you know your card loadout, like what weapons, perks, you know, mechanical aspects of it. So if anybody wants to look at that kind of stuff, I've got a whole – that's the most fleshed out part of that page. Um, I'm also working on writing my own version of the lore for the game. And I plan on putting that up there as well. I've got a little bit up, but not as much as I plan on getting up there. And um, the rest of it's just kind of other similar hobbies. Like I'm into A Billion Suns, which is a space fleet game. I made a fleet out of drywall anchors. And um, that's going to be up there. You know, stuff like that. And Ben, uh, your YouTube channel, tell folks a little bit about what they can expect to find on the channel and uh, just whatever else you want to talk about. Yeah, so my YouTube channel is called BP Custom Creations. Uh, it's I, I, I hesitate to say tutorials, but it's kind of me building things and then walking through how I'm building them. Uh, so uh, people that are interested in learning how to do this kind of thing can glean from that how they might do things as well. I have a couple tutorials up there, but basically it's me creating things and trying to keep it fun and punchy. Uh, I'm, I'm a complete novice when it comes to video editing. So this is like (laughs) starting this YouTube channel is my first foray into (laughs) doing this kind of stuff. But I'm also on Instagram under the same name and Facebook as well. BP custom creations. I probably should have said what my site was. I I was going (laughs) to (laughs) ask. It's uh, how to be awkward. (laughs) How to be awkward.com is the how fitting the address. <laughs> right well back in like high school it used to be a a web comic and i've just kept the domain for years because my email is attached to it now so i figured i have it i may as well use it so i gutted it and turned it into a gaslands page and then as a side bonus right you still also have your web comics and so if people are interested in seeing those they can still see those on there right they shouldn't be, but uh, <laughs> they are still on the site in a hidden capacity. If uh, any friends or family want to check them out, I will tell you where I put them. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so how to be awkward, the comic book has officially been hidden. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, that, that stuff didn't age well. I'm a different man than the, than the guy who wrote those. <laughs> uh, all I know is the Mr. Reverend and I literally, like, I, it came to my head one morning to show him those web comics, and we just sat there reading them for like 30 minutes and laughing our asses off so i don't know we think they're funny still so well i appreciate that <laughs> you're welcome for the thing you another, don't do anymore another place that uh you can find both of us is on the facebook group for gas lines. if you just like search for gas lines, i mean like that's probably the most interactive way uh to to see what we do and reach out i know chris chris has like tons i mean just talking about your builds what you're are you did you hit 100 yet no, I'm 93, I think is my last count <laughs> that's on the site. And then I've got 94 through 97 sitting on my desk here in progress. Um, but when I get to 100, I plan on actually entering that car, the month competition, whatever the theme is at the time is going to be my 100th car. Nice. You should hold it off for August. That's usually the big one. <laughs> if you I don't want it to be long. 
too big. Like, <laughs> on the one hand, it's great that you're an admin because I don't have to go against you at it. <laughs> but I every, so I everyone kind of participates in August. Even even James jumps in for August. But <laughs> oh, that's fair. Uh, uh, no, I don't know. Maybe maybe the month after I'll do that one. <laughs> Because Chris can't do anything for my birthday, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I do also want to say, like, that it's it's easy to be intimidated when you first look at a lot of what people are doing, and not not to be. I'm not trying to say like, look at look at Chris, look at me, we're amazing. But uh, you know, we've been doing this for years, and if you're just starting to get into the hobby, you're not gonna make something the same way as someone who's been doing it for two or three years, but you can get there, right? It's not, it's it, like going back to accessibility. Like I use craft paints from the dollar store. <laughs> I use junk. I use, you know, dollar cars. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not impossible. And yeah. just use it as inspiration. Don't, don't get intimidated. Use it as inspiration and, and steal things from everyone. <laughs> On so, top yeah. of that. Sorry. Oh. I actually wanted to feed into because you guys are kind of really uh, naturally going into the last question before you do that, Chris, because I think you guys are doing what I was about to ask for people who want to get into this. Where should they go to start? What's like maybe the the top things they should consider buying like that you wish you would have known you had the first time? Chris, do you want to go first since I just kind of stopped you from talking? <laughs> no, that's fine. Um well, honestly, getting into the Facebook group, great way to get all those questions answered. It's I've, I've been in a couple of really toxic fandoms in my time, and Gaslands is nowhere near all that. It's one of the most supportive and friendly communities I've ever been a part of. So it's a really good place to get in, put up your, 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 your first attempt at a car. You, know, you get constructive criticism if you ask for it. Otherwise, it's just generally real supportive. Um, but as far as like... Stuff I wish I knew when I started this, where to get styrene in America. <laughs> <laughs> what What is styrene? Because I know Ben mentioned that. I, I don't know what this is. It's just a raw material we use. It's a plastic that they use for like model trains and uh, architecture, like making models and stuff like that. So, you know, if you are going to get into this, you can get a lot of mileage out of just plain styrene. It's relatively cheap not as cheap as finding trash but relatively cheap and um you can find it in the states at least at most rail hobby railroad uh places like anybody that sells model trains yeah. they generally have that stuff and I, I wish i knew that going in because it took me a while to even figure out how to ask that question and then i kept googling it and getting back hits on like blank credit cards and stuff like that so it didn't really uh hit right away but that that was my big my big first thing i wish i knew was that yeah styrene styrene was just to comment on what the styrene thing before i answer your question but the styrene thing was hard for me too uh in japan because only because i didn't want to pay for real styrene from the hobby shop because it's like it was like three four bucks for just a little pack of a couple rods uh so it's it's not cheap but uh you can actually use the plastic packaging. Um, if you check the plastic codes of recycling symbols, you see the three little like arrows. I think I want to say it's number six. And of course, because this is live, I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> if, if you look it up, I'm pretty sure it'll say PS, which means polystyrene. Uh, and that will actually chemically, uh, you can chemically bond that with the plastic cement. And the best one, the best plastic cement that I recommend, because they're all pretty much the same price, I think, is Tamiya Extra Thin. It's in a green, it has a green cap. It's by far my favorite uh, plastic glue. And it just shoots, if you put two pieces together and just touch it with the, the applicator, it just shoots right into the, the, the bond and it bonds pretty quick. Yeah. And then as far as, so you mentioned a 3D printer, what... I actually have a 3D printer too. So anybody else who uses 3D printing for their modeling, what kind of material do you recommend working with? Because I've been having fun still trying to figure that shit out. <laughs> for 3D printing? Yeah, like uh, so, do you use PETG or PLA or things like so that? So I, I actually have a, I use the SLA printer. So I'm not, I, I have an FDM printer as well that's really old and it's sitting in a, in a pile of shame that's just sitting there for forever, but uh, I got a. I have an AnyCubic uh, photon. Nice. Which, I have an AnyCubic too. So. 
Okay, yeah. I, I don't... They're great, like little side nerd for anybody looking into 3D printers. I love mine, so. Yeah, I would just say, I, so I have the I have the Photon Mono, which I don't think they sell anything that's not monochrome now, the screens, if you're looking into SLA printers, but uh, I do your homework before you buy. I don't know if I would recommend any Cubic over, say, Frozen. I know Frozen is a bit, it's P H. R O Z E N if you're Googling it, but uh, the frozen line is a bit more expensive, but I think reliability is a lot higher for that. And then Elegoo has a lot more support than any cubic. Uh, so, I mean, obviously like I, I still haven't had many issues once the temperature, you have to be careful of temperature a lot more for resin printing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I use water washable. Uh, I just use the Elegoo water washable resin because I, the fumes from like IPA and the or the isopropyl alcohol and things just get to be a bit too much. Uh, I do have an extraction fan that I, I built like an enclosure for my printer, but still it's a bit, it's a bit annoying to have to wash, but just a word out there about resin is that whatever you're using, it is toxic. So uh, do your homework. <laughs> that's, that's what I would say, but getting in. Yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't actually answer fully the, the last question about getting into the hobby, which I think this is really important is, uh, you don't really have to start with much. Um, and I, one of my favorite materials even now is just playing cardstock, which could be cardstock that you buy or cardstock that you use from like a cereal box or, you know, what, whatever you want to use, like cardstock is awesome. And I would say combined with super glue and baking soda, if I have super glue, baking soda and cardstock, I can probably make anything. Uh, because, and I, I know a lot of people in the hobby will know this, but if you, if you hit something with super glue and then sprinkle some baking soda or baking powder on top of it, uh, what it does is, uh, it actually increases the surface area for that glue to flow over, which catalyzes the, the process of it, uh, hardening. So I, I, it's not anything chemical to do with the baking soda itself, but it increases the surface area. And if anyone follows Adam Savage, uh, you'll definitely know what I'm talking about. He did some demonstrations of using super glue bonds with activator, no activator, and uh, baking soda as an activator. So if you have those things, obviously you need a hobby knife. Obviously you need some, probably need some nippers. So little pliers to cut things. And the one thing, if you're looking to make like a $15 tool purchase, which is not, not a whole lot, I would say very early on, if you're getting into die cast car modification, buy the jeweler's saw, buy the jeweler's saw, <laughs> learn how to use it from an early point, And you'll be so much happier with yourself. I can't tell you how many hours I spent drilling and filing to get cuts made, <laughs> like drill along a line and then file it flush. Don't do that. Just don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah. That and like, really, if you know, it's an important tool to get to know, it's almost kind of better to start early. Right. Because like you have even said, your earlier work is not your best work, but you could have been, you know, learning this new tool, like along with that. Exactly. So that's that's awesome piece of advice. <laughs> well, the last thing I wanted to bring up here is to kind of revisit a story the Reverend uh, brought up about her brother, Chris. And it involves a bagel dog and someone being clotheslined. So, so we'll start yeah. with the Reverend first and then we'll have uh, you, Chris, kind of give your retort as to what actually happened here. So I've already told this story on the show before, and I don't even remember what brought it up, but here we go again. <laughs> it was a quiet morning in the house. I woke up and wanted one thing, and that was a delicious bagel dog from the Swans truck. And my mother used to always order these things. And so I woke up, I went, I made my bagel dog. I'm sitting on the couch and Chris eventually ambles out of his room and says, mm, that smells good. And I said, well, it sucks to be you because it's the last one. And at that moment, the microwave went off. And this, <laughs> this is the part where I think we do agree. We both start running. Chris somehow gets ahead of me, turns and clotheslines me. <laughs> I hit the ground. <laughs> he goes and gets the bagel dog. And my, by the time my mother comes out and is asking what is going on, I just remember I am gasping for air on the ground and he is standing over me eating the bagel dog. And that is the only thing I remember about this situation. 
you got all the major points. Um, the way I remember it was that it was after school. <laughs> we used to have the bagel dogs for snack whenever we'd get home. I put the last one in the microwave. You got it while I was off in another room. And that's why I clotheslined you. <laughs> Fair, I guess. So, as far as I'm concerned, T stole the meal out of my mouth, and that's where I came in like that. And as far as I'm concerned, Chris is a fucking liar, and it was in the morning, and I always woke up before him, and that's how I always knew my story was true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to settle this one here today, folks. But no, it was definitely, uh... <laughs> there weren't nest cams back then. I'm sure our mother would have had them if they existed. But uh, no, unfortunately, there is no evidence. But it is kind of one of my favorite examples. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> this is so one of my favorite examples, though, of how two people can... Like, cause I do, I do remember it that way. Like, I'm sure Chris remembers it that way too. But now that it's been like two decades, there's no convincing me that what I remember isn't correct. Anyway. <laughs> so that's our lovely childhood. Uh, so, you know, you can't call CPS now, guys. We're adults. <laughs> Plus you gave me a concussion not long after that. So we're... Oh yeah, that's the story. <laughs> That's the story that I referenced is the story that we don't tell anymore because last time we told it at a bar with our friends, they all looked at us like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the plus side, you get a full authority on that because I don't remember that afternoon. <laughs> Probably because I knocked you out. But uh... <laughs> On that note, I think we will wrap it up here for another week then. So, Chris. Ben, thank you very much for taking time out of your weeks, especially you, Ben, for uh, joining us all the way in Japan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's yes. been a pleasure. I think we had all of the time zones involved finally in our show. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the Beatles did it in the 60s and now we're doing it today. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all for listening to this episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. Remember, every Saturday in this podcast space, we'll have something to entertain your ear holes. Until we meet again, we bid you adieu. Happy crafting, folks. And baby, you get a Cadillac. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.